So it's a great honor actually to me to, to here, be here today representing the ITP Board of Directors in present the, presenting the 2016 ITP Mazaru Ibuka Consumer Electronics Award. This award is sponsored by Sony Corporation and recognizes outstanding contributions in the field of consumer electronics technology. This year, we are indeed fortunate to honor Steve, Stephen J. Sasson, president of Stephen J. Sasson Consulting, LLSC, in New York. While working as an engineer in the Kodak Apparatus Division Research Laboratory, Steve Sasson embarked on a new project about two years after coming on board. He decided to design the world's first digital camera. Not bad. Between 1974 and 1976, he built a successful prototype, and in doing so, changed our world forever. From humble, grainy image produced by device, by today's standards, exceedingly large proportions, came digital cameras that are a part of our medical devices, our satellites, our cellular telephones, and even augmented reality eyewear. Steve Sasson's original concept for the digital camera was elegant. His design used a fast charge coupled device readout linked to a digital buffer memory with a slow transfer to a non-volatile digital storage medium. From that original concept has evolved an entire industry and has caused the reshaping of the evolutions of countless others. Today, Digital image captures it everywhere and are part of nearly everything. I think it's safe to say that the work of Steve has truly had an impact upon our world. One of the endorsers of Steve Sasson for the eBook Award put it best. Digital image capture and sharing today is at an all-time high, whether made by smartphone or tablet, point and shoot, or digital SLR camera, image capture has become a nearly involuntary but necessary activity. Like breathing, it has become something we do without giving it a second thought. We have Steve Sasson to thank for that. Actually, it's very appropriate that we are giving this award here in Las Vegas. Yesterday, I was walking around uh, the Venetian and going to a show everywhere people are taking pictures with their either cameras, digital cameras, or cell phones. They're all enjoying very much. They were all taking selfies of themselves. They were in bridges taking pictures. And so that was giving them a lot of pleasure. And furthermore, they will be able to share that almost immediately with their family and friends using some type of Facebook or uh, WhatsApp. So it's amazing. Uh, how much satisfaction in, uh, people are, are deriving from the use of digital cameras in every shape. So Steve Sasson's work has revolutionized the ways in which we capture and share images, memories, and the times of our lives. It's my great pleasure to welcome Steve Sasson, the recipient of the 2016 ITP Mazaro Ibuka Consumer Electronics Award. Please come to the stage. Stephen J. Sasson's groundbreaking work has revolutionized the way images are captured, stored, and shared, critical to our always connected social media world. He is being honored for designing and building the first digital still camera. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, oh, is it on? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, 
You know, for, for a guy who uh, used to scrounge his electronic components off the sidewalks in Brooklyn when I was a kid, or go down a radio row, uh, this is uh, to be honored by uh, the IEEE, uh, the foremost uh, electrical engineering body in the world, is truly, truly uh, a, a wonderful thing, and I'm very humbled by it. So thank you very much for your, for your, for your kind words and, and for your award. Um, it's funny, um, we were referencing all the pictures yesterday. I, I, my wife, uh, uh, Cindy, and I were just coming back from a show last night, and we were uh, coming back, and we saw uh, across the Bellagio, and as we were walking in front of it, the fountain started up, and if you've, you've seen this, it's quite a magnificent thing. And then a uh, big crowd of people, and all of a sudden, out came the digital cameras and, and uh, the cell phones, and then those dreaded selfie sticks. Uh, I almost got taken out by one of them. Um, but it, photography has evolved tremendously uh, in my lifetime, and I've been very privileged to be able to play a small part in that. And uh, I'd like to share with you a little bit about the, the beginnings of uh, digital photography, because it began in an unlikely place um, called the Eastman Kodak Company. And um, I'd like to describe to you uh, uh, a project that basically resulted in the construction uh, and demonstration of a prototype, what we call a digital camera today, and a playback system. And several demonstrations of this uh, project took place throughout the year of 1976 inside of Kodak. Now, I was part of a research laboratory, and you had to do reports on that. And uh, I did a technical report. This technical report was probably, I don't know, 70, 80 pages, largely a technical description of what I had built. But I had spent um, uh, just a little bit of time uh, writing a paragraph to uh, give my impression of where I thought this might lead at the time. So uh, that paragraph is up on the stage here, and we have quite a few people here. So if just this section over here read, reads this, we'll double the number that have done so over the last 30 years, um, because technical reports aren't very widely disseminated. In fact, uh, none of what I'm about to tell you uh, was, well, I wasn't allowed to speak about this until uh, the year 2001. Um, it was at that point that uh, a, a, a local photographer uh, came and asked about it and the company agreed that we should show it and I had kept the original prototype and this was the first photograph ever taken of the camera and the first time I ever uh, spoke about this project. Now my work began, I graduated from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute with a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering and I went to work at the apparatus division of the research laboratories at Eastman Kodak Company. And this is the uh, arm of the company that manufactures all the equipment that utilizes the photographic materials that was manufactured in another part of the company called Kodak Park. And I was in a small, small uh, applied research laboratory where we tried to solve problems on manufacturing lines, come up with new product ideas, uh, and that kind of thing. I was in an electronics research group, and my supervisor named Gareth Lloyd came to me one day in, uh, uh, I think it was late 1974, and suggested uh, that I might want to look at a new type of device called a charge couple device imager uh, and uh, see what I could do with it. Uh, it was a small project just to keep me out of trouble until something more useful came along. And I jumped at the chance because I had done work at, uh, at, at, at my master's degree it had involved optical uh, sensitivity of silicon devices. And so I was really interested in this even though I knew nothing about it. And uh, so th this uh, started with this, the CCD. Now, you, you all, you'll all remember that Boyle and Smith invented this charge coupling concept at Bell Laboratories in, I think, 1969. But the first commercial devices didn't become available until uh, 1974. And this one was an area array. Um, and it was uh, uh, basically a 10,000 element, 100 by 100 square matrix of photosites. It had an architecture called interline transfer. They were starting to make devices that maybe could basically shine a, uh, an optical pattern on it and it would create a corresponding charge pattern and then the charge pattern would use the charge coupling mechanism to get it out of there. So this is one of the first ones that was available. Um, and I was authorized to buy one of these. And so I did. And when it came, it came in a plastic box uh, in, the, in, the, in the foam. It was a 24 pin dip. And on top of it was folded a piece of paper with uh, 12 pre-printed voltage designations to represent the 12 voltage that have to be applied to this device to get it to work. 
And next to each one in, 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 uh, in pencil, it was handwritten the actual voltage that this particular device worked at on the manufacturing line before it left. And at the bottom it said, good luck. <laughs> and uh, the reason was because, uh, as you could imagine, if any one of those voltages was just a little bit off, you just got no output. Um, and so, consequently, it was a very challenging device to work with. Now, the situation I had here uh, was I was in a research laboratory. And uh, this was a very small project. In fact, you know, you've been in laboratories, you know there are big projects, major projects, medium-sized, small ones. This was a filler job. This was something nobody was paying attention to whatsoever. Uh, nobody told me to build anything. They just said, look at this and play with it, see if there's anything useful we can do with it. Maybe metrology, measuring something, or something like that. And so um, it was a very small project. No official reporting was done on it during the whole duration. I just spoke to my supervisor, Gareth, about the progress. I had part-time help. Basically, it was myself and two uh, laboratory technicians, Bob Dieger and Jim Schickler. And both of those fellows were enormously talented and skilled guys. And uh, any success we had with this project was in large part due to their efforts. They were very imaginative. Um, Bob worked on it in the first part, and then Jim worked it on in the second part of it. I had no budget. I couldn't buy anything. Um, I could buy this device, and that was about it. I, anything I wanted to do with this, I would basically have to scrounge for parts. Luckily, I was in one of the most well-stocked research laboratories around, and so that turned out to be helpful. And then uh, I couldn't command any space whatsoever, because uh, I had no priority of any kind, so I had to find actually a, a laboratory at the back of a, of a, of a hallway. Literally, they exist, these back labs. It was at the back of a long hallway. We cleaned it out, and that's where we did our work. So, uh, in summary, our plan was unrealistic. No one was uh, paying attention. I had no money, and hardly anybody even knew where we were working. In other words, the situation was just about perfect. Now, the approach I decided to take um, was uh, digital. I had done some small work on my first year or so at Kodak on small SSI development for some control for machines, so I had learned a little bit about that. And I would love to tell you that I had the foresight to be able to tell you that the whole world would be going digital. But the real reason I did what was to freeze time. I couldn't deal with a helical scan mechanism that would be the only rational way to, take a, to deal with a, a two-dimensional image at the time. I had no money, I had no expertise to do that, so I thought if I could just digitize this, uh, the output of this, of this device, I could store it and do something with it. I didn't know what, but I started to do, could do something with it. Um, and so I decided, since this was a, char a two-dimensional charge pattern that was corresponded to a two-dimensional light pattern that was on for a period of time, that's kind of like what film does. So I thought I'd try to build a camera device. And so I thought I'd model it just after a conventional camera, which had a removable storage mechanism. You take the film out of a camera, I was going to basically take whatever I stored this on away from the camera. Um, then I said, what am I going to do with this image? And I said, well, maybe I'd like to look at it. I didn't know why I wanted to look at it. I just figured I could do some measurements with it and store it somehow. And so I had to be able to, be able to electronically view this image. There was no real good way to print the image at the time. So I had to build a playback device. And so this entire project really was breaking up into two parts. It was the camera itself, and then there was the playback device itself. So after about a year or so of work in this back laboratory, this, produced, uh, this was produced here. Um, this is sort of the definition of beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, this camera weighs uh, uh, about eight and a half pounds. Um, it, uh, it ran off of batteries. Um, it stored uh, the uh, information digitally on a digital cassette. I found that digital, that was actually a well logging digital cassette that I found in the back of a magazine. And I stuck it into the box. The optics, of course, came from the XL55 movie camera line, which happened to be, luckily, right downstairs from our laboratory. I went downstairs and, and borrowed uh, a camera that was not uh, being used and used the optical assembly for that. And that, that's, that, that's how I did all the imaging. And um, I stored 30 images. I decided to store 30 images on a cassette. That number, I chose that deliberately between, halfway between 24 and 36, the two film, consumer film lengths at the time. Sometimes when you're presenting a concept, if you try to put it into more familiar terms, you don't have to have as many battles. And, and pr primarily, it's foldable as well. Now, this camera here, by the way, it still exists. Um, it's still a property of Eastman Kodak Company, and it's presently on display at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. 
Um, but here's how I remember the camera. It all unfolded. We did wire wrap for all of the digital uh, uh, wiring. And all of our prototyping work was done directly in here. We didn't have any money or time to build any boards or do any prototyping. Anything we did was right in here. So it unfolded. We would work on it and then fold it up, say a little prayer, and hope it worked, right? And um, that's how it spent most of its time. It would work when in the open position. Um, but uh, uh, this is the, the board. The architecture of this was fairly straightforward. It is rep represents the fundamental architecture of digital cameras today. Uh, and that is the image was captured in um, 50 milliseconds and, and stored in an onboard uh, digital memory. This was the memory card that it was stored in. So this is kind of the first digital memory card for photography. It was hand wired by Bob Dieger. And yes, he did need glasses when he was done with that. Um, here's just to show you how the board, the power supply board, we had so many different technologies I was grabbing on to try to use. It was just boards on top of boards on top of boards. I took these pictures only a few years ago. Um, they weren't in the original technical report. And now the playback system. And this is really uh, something that was uh, a real challenge because microprocessors were just coming out. And I was able to convince our management, uh, I, I wrote a really, I thought, imaginative request to do a microprocessor research for the research laboratories. And so uh, they bought it, and so I bought a microprocessor development system that used the new bus, which was a publicly verifiable bus, so I could build stuff that would go into this thing. And uh, it was based on the 6800 microprocessor. And so uh, that came back to my laboratory and was used as the playback system for this. That wasn't its justification, but that's what it ended up being used it as for. And um, you can see that on the left side of there were the tapes. That was my photo album. And what I do is I put a tape into each uh, mechanism. The mechanism would read it in. It would take about 23 seconds to read that into the machine, eight seconds to do the image manipulation that I had to do because I had to convert between um, 100 lines and the 490 displayed lines on a television set. I didn't want to do that, but I had to do that. So we had to do that in assembly language programming, and you all know how much fun that was. Um, and then the image would be created into an NTSC television signal, black and white, and the image would show up there. So that's what the playback system looked like. Um, here was a picture from the report. I had to document this system, and I went to my image science friends at Kodak, and anytime you do anything, no matter how weird, you had to do a standard test target and do an evaluation of it. And so I uh, got this standard test target. It's called the Boy Dog tar uh, Target. And I backlit it with a light box, stood it on the end, took a picture with my, uh, my prototype camera, and then uh, put the tape back into the playback system, played it back on the TV set, and then slid it next to each other. And then, because I was not allowed to take pictures inside of Kodak, um, I had to hire a film photographer to come up and take this picture for the report. So this shows you basically how the system uh, performed. It was available light photography. And I want to show you here for a second because I'm going to talk a little bit about the reaction people gave to me when I presented this. And I wanted to show you that this had all of the defects and artifacts that uh, a good digital image in the mid-1970s would have. If you look very carefully in the upper right-hand corner, you can see contouring. I only digitized to four bits. I did that for a very practical reason. Most of, the, most of the SSI I was working with came with quads, quad latches and things like that. If I wanted to go to six bits, which I really wanted to, I would have had to basically double the size of the circuitry. Um, and I thought four, enough, four was good enough to, uh, to demonstrate the concept. On that dog, there are whiskers, believe it or not. So the resolution was clearly not what you wanted it to be. Um, you could also see um, the, uh, if you look on the side of the dog, uh, the stair stepping on the nose, that was my interpolation that didn't do, didn't do a very good job at that as well. And then, of course, throughout the, uh, the image, you see the photo response non-uniformities. This was about as good a as they could make the device at the time. Uh, so this represented basically what people saw. Um, the timetable of events. Um, the first image was taken in uh, December of 1975, I think around December 9th, 1975. Uh, it was taken of a, a young lab technician named Joy Marshall. She was sitting at a teletype down the hallway, and once we had pulled this all together, we had worked on this for a year, we hadn't seen anything. Just oscilloscope traces and voltage measurements. There was nothing to look at. Once we had to build the playback unit and the camera, everything was, we thought was working. We picked up the camera, walked down the hallway. I asked Joy if she would pose for a picture. She 
agreed. I took a head and shoulder shot of her. I came back uh, because I, I took one shot of her and um, put the uh, uh, tape into the machine and up popped the image and you could see her hair, shoulder length hair, you could see the, uh, the white background and her face was completely static, distorted, completely static, totally unrecognizable. Now Jim and I were very excited about this because we knew a thousand reasons why you might not see anything at all. Um, but uh, we were happy, so we said so much is working. I remember standing there looking at so much is working, this is fantastic, this is great. And Jim was saying the same thing, he says this is fantastic, you know. Well Joy had followed us back to the lab and look was standing at the doorway. We turned around, we saw her and she looked at us and she said needs work. Turned around and walked out. I had reversed the order of the bits between when I designed the playback system and the, the camera system. So uh, black would be all zeros, white would be all ones, that was okay, but anything in between was switched. And it took us about an hour to figure that out, I rewired it, and then the first picture was taken. I wrote that technical report uh, late in 1976 um, with a simple abstract that's shown there. And then we applied for and received the first patent for a digital camera in 1978. You'll notice it was called electronic still camera. I'll tell you why that was the case at the time. Because I didn't want to talk about it being digital at all. It was a completely digital system. Right from the output of the CCD all the way to the output pin going to the TV set. Um, the, here I want to talk about the reaction now. And the reaction to my man from my management was interesting. Um, I was working at Eastman Kodak Company. And they had a proud and long history of over 100 years supplying photographic materials and devices to the general public worldwide. And so uh, I, when I came in and I demonstrated this system, and I'll tell you how I did it, I would take that camera that I showed you, and we would go to a conference room that was located relatively near my laboratory, and the managers would gather. And what I would do is I would walk in and I would take a picture, a head and shoulder shot of the person sitting on the front on the right side. And then, because the, ca the, camera, the picture was camera captured in 50 milliseconds, but it took 23 seconds to record it to the tape and to cleverly hide that time, I started to describe what I had just done. And then I would take a picture of the person sitting on the first part on the left side with the second image. And then I would put the camera down the middle of the table, I would pop out the cassette and I would put it into the playback system which I had shown you before and I would put that on a little table and we had rolled it into the back of the conference room. And so that's how it went. And uh, we received a lot of comments and it worked its way all the way up the management chain. I must have demonstrated this, my guess is between 15 and 20 times throughout 1976 to different organizations and different people. And you know how it is when you're in a big organization, you show it to your boss and when he gets comfortable, he invites his bosses. And then they come and when they get comfortable, they invite their bosses. And I got fairly high up. I got uh, to the head of the apparatus division, which was the guy in charge of all equipment design and manufacture for Eastman Kodak Company. But I never went to the corporate officers. And uh, I found out later that the corporate officers had heard about this and asked if they should see it, and the answer was no. And they said, um, no, it's not ready for prime time. Now you gotta understand, here I was in 1976, I was taking pictures without film, I was displaying them without uh, making prints, I was using no consumables whatsoever. So it would have been hard for managers at this point to explain to their bosses exactly what this was. And so uh, I, was a little has I was a little disappointed at the time because I had never met the CEO. I thought it would be kind of cool. Um, but uh, we did show it to a lot of people. And the reaction in general was it's too out far out there for uh, any serious consideration. And what I mean by that is that you got to understand, not only I wasn't using any uh, film or paper, I wasn't even asking for the use of the photo finishing network that had been developed over the last 30 years or so throughout the world. I didn't need it. I was suggesting that all of this could be done right inside the little conference room like I was doing here. And so it was a paradigm shift that people were uncomfortable with, uh, both from a business point of view, obviously, uh, and also from a technical point of view. And there were a lot of technical challenges out there. They were quite convinced people would never want to view their pictures on a television set. Electronic viewing was just not unheard of. Now, TV sets are inferior to prints, that's clear. 
Um, but clearly there was going to be improvements in, 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 in electronic imaging in the future. But they were also convinced that people wanted prints because prints was the way that you shared your images. They've been doing it for over 100 years. Prints last. You don't need any equipment or knowledge to use them. It's a great storage device. And so consequently that paradigm shift was also difficult to, to grasp at the time. And then how are you going to store these images? What's an electronic photo album going to look like? Remember, there's no personal computers sitting around anywhere here. Um, and then they, uh, they also asked about film-like quality. You saw the quality I was dealing with here. I was trying to compare it to 110 film quality, which was basically the worst film format I could find that was available for consumers. And um, when estimates, when I made, had to make estimates as to how long it would take for this to reach that level, uh, I made an estimate from the research lab. They told me I needed about 2 million pixels to make it equal to a 110 film. I had 10,000 use Moore's Law because I thought that was the only thing I could lay my hands on. I thought it would take between 15 and 20 years before this would become a commercial reality for consumers. Uh, I was very lucky in that prediction. I, there's so many things that went one way and the other over the next 15 or 20 years, but it turned out we introduced our first camera 18 years later. Now I want to share with you just a little bit about the context of 1976. First of all, um, digital was not part of the everyday experience that we're used to today. Everything is digital. You can't sell a product if it doesn't have digital associated with it. Digital back then was esoteric. It was unreliable. It was complicated. It was not part of our normal world. And so digital did not help me. This was a completely digital product, as I mentioned before. So that made it seem even more distant. The only thing I could do was talk about I, the only digital product I knew of that was available for a consumer, which consumer in this case was an engineer, was the HP 35 calculator. Does anybody remember the HP 35 calculator? Thank you. Thank you. I, I give talks sometimes and nobody knows what that is. Um, but this was the, the first product that, that I could actually um, uh, point to and say, think of the calculator with a lens. That's the analogy I was trying to use. And then there were other developments that were part of this world that was going to unfold that I really didn't consider very much at all. I did talk about personal computers. While I was demonstrating this, Jobs and Wozniak was introducing their first Apple computer on a board. You remember that? Some of you guys probably remember that. And um, they were pitching this, and I, I got attracted to it because Wozniak used exactly the same DRAMs as I used, except I used, about, I used 12 chips and he used eight on his. And I thought, uh, well, this is cool. You know, it's, it's heading in the right direction. This could be my playback system. So I talked about that and this thing was selling for $666 and it wasn't a complete computer. If you remember, you had to buy the keyboard and you had to buy power supplies and monitors and all that kind of stuff. But this was their idea of a, of a, of a, a home computer, at least for hobbyists. So I was challenged very directly by the people in the professional and the consumer photographic terms. They said, okay, Sasson, I said, here you've got um, this, uh, this computer here for $666, plus all the stuff you have to get to make it work. You have your little calculator up there with a lens, which I think cost about $400 at the time. So for over $1,000, you're going to give me something that gives me a way worse picture than an Instamatic that could cost $25. That was where we were. And that was the challenge that we faced. It's hard to think about the future immediately when it was going to be decades in the, in the, in the, in the making. Um, but this was the comparisons that were being made. The internet, I really didn't think much about the internet at all. This was about the state of the internet at the time I was giving these talks. I, always, I only thought about point-to-point -point communication. I thought in my report I talked about being able to get on it with a modem and send it to another place. I never even imagined how the internet would unfold and be what it is today. And then obviously local area networks and photographic printing in the home. The ability to make color photographs in the home I never even thought about that. I ended up spending the last half of my career doing that for Kodak, but uh, at the time, uh, it was unheard of. So all of these things as we take granted today, uh, really, this is the situation when I was presenting this. Now, um, what happened next, about the same time, um, a fellow named Bryce Beyer was working in the research laboratory. And Bryce uh, was dealing with the problem of how do you get color out of a, a monochromatic uh, sensor like a CCD. And he came up with the Bayer Array. And if you've ever read this patent, it's really more about image how we see color than it is about digital cameras. This was, he solved the problem for digital cameras before we had digital cameras. I met Bryce. Uh, we spoke about this a little bit. I was in awe of this guy because he could figure out color and I was really not very good at that at all. 
Um, but clearly, this was one of the seminal inventions and patents uh, of, of the 70s. If you've got a digital camera with you right now, you probably have a buyer array on it. Uh, still video floppy. I love still video floppy. Sony introduced that concept in the early 80s. I thought it was terrific for two reasons. One, it got our management interested in this because once you have a competitor like Sony boldly announcing that they're going to do, get into the snapshot business with an electronic approach, um, that caused a lot of interest on the part of management and then they started investing more into, the, into electronic imaging. So that was really good. I like that. The other reason I liked it is I knew it would never really work because the, uh, the encoding system that they had was really based on a video encoding system and it would have reproduced inferior image quality any way you look at it, no matter what you did. And you can't replace a technology uh, with an inferior one when it comes to one of its primary attributes, which would be image quality when it comes to still pictures. But anyway, it was exciting to see that development and Kodak started to invest very heavily in that. In 1986, they showed their first megapixel sensor. Kodak realized that this was going to be, we had to make sensors bigger than like RCA and Fairchild were thinking about. They were thinking about replacing Viticon tubes. They were thinking about NTSC resolution to a large extent or PAL. Um, but we knew we had to get bigger and we knew we had to have uh, uh, buyer arrays on it. So they introduced their first imager at a show. It wasn't in production, but it was at a show in 1986. This was to demonstrate that we were actively looking at this because we were running into a public relations battle to some extent. We knew, fo we knew this was coming. We didn't know when, um, and we wanted to show that we were on top of it, because people trusted Kodak. And then image compression. Um, this was another interesting area. I worked uh, with um, Dr. Majid Rabani at Kodak, who's one of the world experts in image compression. And uh, Majid and I uh, worked with, on a project to make a transceiver, which was used to uh, capture images, uh, and then we would do image compression on it using a DCT approach, which turned out to be the JPEG approach. And, um, and then send it over telephone lines and then reconstruct it on the other side. I don't have time here to tell you all about that project. I could just tell you that uh, CBS News actually used one of our devices to get the only pictures you could get out of uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989. Um, uh, and we had no idea they had bought that, but it turned out to be actually quite useful. But we learned a lot about how to put image compression, take it out of the lab and put it into a product that way. And I want to show you uh, a camera that I built soon after that uh, this is a camera you've never seen before and you probably never heard of. There were only six of them built. Uh, it was called the eCam. And the reason this looks like a camera is because I had the very good fortune of working with a fellow named Bob Hills, who was a Scotsman. He was a, a senior camera designer at Eastman Kodak Company, been designing camera for over 30 years. He knew more about camera design than I would ever know. Um, and I went to him and I said, we'd like to build, put this image compression we learned about, this megapixel sensors we've got, we want to do it on memory cards, we want to put this into a, uh, a camera. And he said to me, Sasson, okay, we'll do that, but it's not going to look like one of those crazy cameras you build. It's going to look like a real camera. It's going to act like a real camera. And so you can see we worked with Chinon on this, and we put this together. Um, and you can see some of the specs up here. This camera actually captured uh, 1.3 uh, megapixel color images, did image compression on a buffer, buffer basis, and then stored them to memory cards. The memory card slots on the, on the, on the right side on the bottom top view. On the left side, I'm sorry. Um, so this was, a, this was an exciting development. We never, we never commercialized this camera. When we went to uh, our photographic friends and said, could you sell this camera? The answer was, of course we can, but we won't if it comes to the one expense of one film camera. And we ran into a difficult period now because now it was pretty obvious to the technical people that this was going to happen. If we could do this, what could electronic companies do? Because we had no special skills here. We, we knew a lot about image processing, but in terms of building electronic hardware, Kodak was not the world leader in that. Well, fortunately, uh, we did start to commercialize cameras. Um, a fellow named Jim McGarvey headed up a group uh, that started producing cameras in 1989. And this one first one was called the Hawkeye Imaging Accessory. We had to call it an imaging accessory. We couldn't call it a camera. Um, but basically, it was a camera that used a Nikon body. I think it was an 8008 stock Nikon body. Put the imager in that, downloaded the electro electronics into that box you see there. And then we used that to go to government customers because they were the only people that would, could afford this. And um, we said, uh, would you be interested? And they said, yeah. And they, but th we saw that they wanted all different types of, uh, of, uh, of, different types of uh, electronics and options to be available. That's why it's so modular. 
Uh, and I think one of these uh, flew on a 1991 space shuttle mission. But there weren't many of them made. But Jim and his team kept at it, and uh, they came up with a professional DCS, which was a camera uh, that, uh, this was, I uh, forget which camera body this was used. But it was uh, self-contained electronics. You could take a picture with this, you could view it immediately, and you could send it over telephone lines back to your publisher. This was money in the bank for publishers. So you, find, you gotta find the right customer. So they would pay the $25,000 that it cost for this thing, plus the hip pack you have to wear that if you want it to be portable. We sold almost 1,000 of these. Um, and this was the first time that we were actually able to get commercial inroads with these things. And this was in the 92 time frame. And then quickly after that, in 90, I think it was 93 and 94, we came up with called the DCS 200. You can see now it's all self-contained in one, one, one piece. And uh, this stored 50 images on a two and a half inch uh, SCSI uh, drive uh, uh, inside. It, I think it had image compression in it. Um, and this was a really remarkable feat in such a, such a small time. We sold about 3,000 of these. These went to, started to go to uh, press photographers. Began, again, they wanted to be able to get their images back. Um, and it turned out to be a very significant camera. It's the first time Kodak put actually their name on a digital camera. You see uh, Kodak on the, on the, on the uh, body of that, that third camera I put up there. The reason was because uh, Jim tells me that the camera designers, they had worked very hard at this, but we, we used Nikon bodies because professionals like Nikons, and, uh, but we never told Nikon about it. Nikon would learn about it when we introduced it at the show. And, um, and so uh, everybody thought, well, it's a Nikon camera, so it must be a Nikon digital camera. So our guys got upset and they said, you gotta put Kodak in bigger letters than Nikon on there. So you see, that's where they show up. The, um, Ken Perolsky is one of the, the real leaders in digital photography at Eastman Kodak Company, if not the world. Uh, he headed up a team uh, and introduced uh, the first Apple Quick Take camera. That Apple had a market for this. We didn't have a channels. They came to us and said, could you build us a digital camera for this? Because they wanted an on-ramp for their computers, which were very heavily, going heavily intensive image processing at the time. And um, so we did that. And this camera was the first sub $1,000 consumer camera. I think it held about four or eight shots. Uh, it was VGA resolution. Um, and uh, it was sold under the Apple brand. Kodak didn't appear anywhere on it, but we designed and built it. And then a year later, the DC-40, which looks remarkably similar, as you can see, uh, was a little bit higher resolution. And that was the first time Kodak put their uh, name on a camera. So, um, and then the rest of that was we reached megapixel sensors around in 19, 97, 98, I think. And then the resolution on digital cameras has increased about a million pixels per year since then. And, um, and you can imagine uh, the impact it's had. I think it's, you, all, you all probably have cameras with you right now. Um, so let me uh, end my, my comments here today uh, with, with a story. Um, because um, well, I think all talk should end with a story. I, I, I was finally, uh, they asked me to speak about this in 2001, as I mentioned, and then they, they actually sent me to public relations school and they sent me on a big tour going out throughout Asia and Australia um, to talk about, because now we were proud that we were leaders in digital photography. Um, and um, I was in China, I think it was in Shanghai, and when you do interviews, um, you sit on one side of the table and then all the reporters file in and they sit on the opposite side and one by one they ask you a question, you answer it, and then when they get to the end they all get up and leave and a whole bunch more come in. And while uh, I was between one of those sessions when they were walking in, um, I had the tape that I had taken some of my first digital pictures with, with me. Um, and next to it was a camera we were introducing, so the Easy Share One. It was a pretty revolutionary camera at the time. It was the first Wi-Fi camera. Um, in about six megapixel resolution, as I remember. Uh, had a bunch of RAM in it and had a fold-out display. It was really a nice camera. And um, I noticed that they were about the same size. And it struck me uh, that there's an old saying about engineers. Um, that engineers always overestimate what they can do in five years and underestimate what they can do in 20. And I have to add to it that they can't imagine what they can do in 30 years. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Steve. I, I think we got time for a couple questions. Uh, if, if anyone does have one, I'll, uh, I'll take just a minute here to, to note that the, uh, the third Missouri Book Award 
uh, in 91 was given to uh, Gilbert Amelia, uh, who was part of the uh, Bell Labs team. Oh. Uh, and uh, at the time, uh, it was for the advances uh, of the commercialization of the uh, Bell Labs technology uh, when he was at Fairchild that, you know, actually oh, yeah. created the yeah. CCC there. Yeah. So it's really, we kind of come full circle wow. here again. Very cool. Yeah. Any, uh, any questions? Uh, yeah, Bob? One reaction you didn't mention is that the camera didn't have consumables. Yes. And Kodak's business was consumable. Yes. Was that a reaction in 1976, or was that so far in the future they didn't worry about it? Well, well in 76, they weren't that worried about it because it was so distant. The pictures were so poor, it was so ugly, and all that kind of thing. Um, however, I did, uh, and you learn a lot about public relations when you introduce concepts like this. Uh, I, when I invited my people to the meeting to demonstrate it, I entitled the talk filmless photography, which was a really bad choice of titles, you know, given the audience. Um, but it was becoming clear that there was no consumables. I, I didn't use any consumables of any kind, and I wasn't suggesting that we would need them. I thought the only penalty you paid was batteries, and if they were rechargeable, that was it. The idea was to get away from handling film. I didn't like handling film and such, but um, just to get away from all of that. You know? And so in the original time, they were clearly aware of it. But in the 1990s, when I told you about that second camera, I mentioned that because now the technology had reached the point of being viable, and now there was the business problem. There was the business model. No one could come up with a business model that was even close to the profitability of consumer film. I don't want to surprise anybody, but consumer photographic film was probably one of the most profitable consumer products ever made. And so you, when you're introducing a new technology, the first question they ask is, what's the business model? Where's, show me the money, as they say, right? And it was very hard to come with anything that was even close to what we had. So there's where we ran into the resistance. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so there are a lot of people in the audience who work within large corporations in R&D laboratories. What advice would you give to any of these people if they have an innovation and um, they want to advance this innovation, but they meet resistance within their organization. How much time do I have to answer that? <laughs> um, I, I can tell you, you know, one, you have to be patient. You know, when you come up with your idea, whatever it is, chances are you've thought about it for days, weeks, months, years. And then when you make your presentation, you go in and they don't get it, right? and you get annoyed, don't. Be patient. You gotta realize they have to come up to speed to this concept, all right? So that's the challenge you have. So I would say be patient. Recognize they don't really know the technology. They start to read you. You become the issue as opposed to your idea. I know that's a hard thing to understand because you think, but this is the idea, it's the technology. They don't know the technology, they don't know how to interpret it, they might get an expert to come in and talk about some aspect of it or another. I had that with this all over the place because I had image quality on the output, photographic, all kinds of technologies were involved, right? But you know what they do is, they look at you and they start saying, do I trust this guy? And so as much as engineers don't like it, how you present yourself really matters to this, and so it's really important. So I think some of the soft skills about this, patience, have a sense of humor. You gotta have a sense of humor. Um, and, uh, and these things take longer than you think. And I worked at this for over 30 years to get to that point. So, okay. I don't know, there it is. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Steve, thank you for a great talk. And uh, to add to your portfolio and, and the credit you've given to this industry, the, the tremendous boost, uh, in 1989, at the ICCE conference, uh, there were a flurry of Kodak presentations, of course, uh, on Bayer images and, and other Bayer images. And uh, uh, Chanaman Square happened during the conference. And most of the tech uh, media that were attending were pulled together by Sony that had sold a lot of cameras into uh, making those images come out of China. And the Chinese government was just could not believe how these things were getting out. They were looking for film at airports and other things. Right. And we were all asked to not write about what was happening. Yeah. But none of that would have happened without you. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, did Kodak explore ways of, of uh, 
perhaps uh, disposable, expendable, collectible storage uh, in, in between your experiments and, uh, and the final partnerships and launch you did of the cameras in the 80s? Y yes, they did, but, but not as aggressively as I would have liked. Um, I remember demonstrating, there were three, three fundamental issues that, that we faced when we started doing this. One was the images themselves, could we make them, could, could they be made good enough to compete with film? The second one was image processing, uh, memory, all these things. They were totally out of the control of Eastman Kodak Company. And the third was some sort of solid state memory, a non volatile memory, right? And uh, believe it or not, that's what I started to work on after I did this camera. I did another one after this, but then I started working on it. Because that I saw was a critical thing, and I started looking at bubble memory and all these kinds of weird things, right? Um, and so I tried to interest the company into making, then people started coming up with EA ROMs, electrically alterable read-only memories. And that technology was interesting. You know, it had some issues, but it was interesting. And I tried to convince the company because Kodak had a tremendous facility to do chip on, 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 on flexible circuit board. Because they, they would do the electronics in the camera, conventional cameras. And so you'd fold it around and put it in these small pocket cameras. Tremendous capability there. And I thought, why don't you make some memory cards with this? You know, little cards like that. And they weren't interested in that at all. And then there was this guy that came in, I'll never forget. It was, uh, it was a guy from SanDisk. And um, I, we made, he signed a non-disclosure. We made a presentation. And I remember him saying, yeah, like solid state film. And I says, how come this guy gets it? And my guys don't, you know? And I mean, everybody knows Sandisk today. But I mean, uh, I, I would say that, that sometimes it's really hard to get people to make that jump. And the, the challenge, by the way, these weren't irrational people. They were really smart people. I had a chance to privilege of knowing many of the CEOs of Kodak. They're really smart guys. They're not dumb. They're not arrogant. They didn't miss anything. They just couldn't see the business model that was competing with what they had. And they have shareholders. They're a publicly held company. As much as the press touts all this stuff, the minute you walk away from a profitable product line to move to a less profitable product line, you don't do so well in the financial press. So they had a lot of challenges on themselves. But we did look at solid state memory uh, for that, but we never developed a core competency there. Sure. One more question. Sure. Hi. Uh, Brian Johnson from Power Rocks. Um, well, thanks for uh, certainly a great uh, you know, historical accounting of a major achievement. Um, but. Uh, well, oh, by the way, I was just thinking about it more to your question. The, the really quick answer is as long as you don't care about a paycheck, you just quit and start your own company. Um, power rocks. Um, but, uh, yeah, so you said that there was a, a lot of voltage rails to that, uh, that, that original um, CCD device. I was just curious, could you comment on the, um, you know, the, 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 the challenge or how you overcame such, such tight voltage regulation challenges? Well, if, if, assuming it's a possible to do it briefly? It's, it's a, it's a, it was a real challenge. Um, all of these devices, as I mentioned before, I say it as a joke, but it's actually true. They were all individual devices. And all of those were the VSS and VDD of the different clocks that you had. So they all had the low current, but voltage had to be reasonably precise. And then the horizontal shift register was a buried channel shift register, so it was a two-phase device. So, but it also had, its voltage was a little less, more tolerant for variation. And then you had the VDD and the output technology. So there was, the voltage is between, going between plus and minus 15, as I remember. And we had to put regulators down to 12 and then individually tweak each one of them. That's why I showed you that picture with all those pots lined up in front. I don't know if you remember that. All those pots had to be individually adjusted. And then, you know, on Wednesday afternoon, all of a sudden something would shift, and then you had to figure out which one it was and carefully note what it was. So one of the challenges I saw with CCDs is they had to get a lot better <laughs> in order to deal with, because I, and I was working in a relatively uh, narrow environmental range. I was in a conference room taking pictures, right? Can you imagine going out somewhere else? So the next project I did, I started to look at uh, temperature variations and storing, in, and storing the charge pattern in the device. I started to use the RCA Big SID device, which came out soon after this. And it was the same challenges there, though. So there was a lot of challenges, but it all had to be custom. I, I never pretended I solved this problem. Yeah, they were, they were biased op amps in some cases, or some cases they were just voltage regulator outputs. Uh, there wasn't much current in any of these. Yeah. The what? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I, the selfie, I, I, I can't, 
I can't take any credit at all for selfies. Like, <laughs> they scare me. Those sticks are dangerous. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know whether everyone is aware that uh, the recipient of the Abuco Award, although our society has a major input into it, uh, is actually an IEEE field award at the corporate level and, and, and really an amazing high status thing. And uh, the other thing people may not be aware of is that the recipient has a choice of the venue which he wants to present it. It's not automatically this one. And we're, we're just so pleased that he was able to come here today and share this with us, and, uh, this amazing story. So let's thank him and give him a chance thank to uh, have much. some food. Thank you, it's my pleasure, my honor. Thank you very much.